So we're reviewing the sales contract, offer to purchase in contract form 2T, and we're on page 274 of the textbook. So group one. Stop one minute. You said you'd put the full legal name with the seller and you're including that with the buyer too? Buy well, tell me what full legal names means. It's like, say for instance, if they have a senior or a junior, um, if they have um, pretty much the names that they go by. That's right. And if they, the middle name, if they familiarize themselves with the middle name, then we would add. And in North Carolina, what do we know about North Carolina's laws if you're married? Your, um, it's a spouse estate and that um, your spouse has to sign. Yeah. And so you, instead of saying John and uh, Jenny Smith, we would say John and his full name and spouse, Jenny and her full name, Smith. And where would you get the seller's name if you were a buyer's agent? Known, you know, as proper, um, public notice. That's right. Uh, Kim said we would get it from the deed. So even if you're a buyer's agent, you can go online and research, get the information from the register of deeds, and see the full legal name of the seller on the deed. And then, of course, you're going to put the full legal name of the buyer on this offered purchase. Okay, go ahead. Um, the property um, street address. Legal description of the property. Okay, what's the most common legal description in North Carolina? Meets and bounds. But let's go up to where they're describing the property. Everyone, this is, we've learned a lot up to this point. For example, it says the property shall include the real estate together with all appurtenances. So an appurtenance example would be what? What's an example of an appurtenance? Well, what's the definition of an appurtenance? <coughs> it's a, um, appurtenance is a right that goes with the property. So it goes along with, so what would be rights and benefits that would go with the property? Could be an easement, an easement appurtenant. What else? Go back to day one. What did we talk about day one? Well, the bundle of rights is a little separate, but you're close. Air rights and surface rights and subsurface rights, they go with, it's a benefit or a privilege that goes with the sale of the real estate. So it says all, all appurtenances, including the improvements and fixtures, and we're going to get into that in a minute, and personal property. And then it even brings up, if there's a mobile home, we have an addendum that would have to be attached because a mobile home, if it's mobile, is a vehicle, isn't it? And so we would have to have the VIN number uh, to alert the attorney so we'd have a um, title exchange for a vehicle. Okay, now, thank you. What else? The purchase price. Okay. Uh huh. So Kim is saying the purchase price is what the buyer is offering, and then below that, it will be smaller components. How are we going to pay for it? And so she she said the due diligence fee. Or any additional like the um, you know the seller's loan, the seller finance. If the seller's going to finance, you put it there. If the, if the buyer's taken over the loan, that would be a loan assumption. Well, let's talk, everybody, about the due diligence fee and the earnest money. These are really good testing areas. The due diligence fee would be a check written to whom? 
the seller. And when would you give it to the seller? When? When we went under contract. Because it says right here, upon the effective date of the contract. And the effective date is really, the effective date of the contract is a little redundant. The effective date is when we go under contract. It's the day the last person signed and communicated that we are under contract. So you'll, if you have a due diligence fee check, it will be written to the seller. And the agent, the broker, or the PB would give that to the seller when we have a sales contract. Okay, so tell me about the initial earnest money deposit. That's not required, right? Due diligence fee is not required, and neither is earnest money. So these are not required, but, but let's think about that a minute. In a market such as we're in now, we're in a seller's market, there's a lot of activity on low inventory. So a lot of houses are receiving uh, multiple offers on them. And so if you're getting multiple offers as a seller, you're gonna look at more than the offer price. You're gonna be looking at, well, how much due diligence fee did I get? How much earnest money fee did I get? Why does that even matter? Why does it matter? Well, that is gonna fall through. If it falls through, the seller keeps the due diligence fee. Everyone, if you had two offers and one offer had a due diligence fee and the other one didn't, you'd probably be inclined to take the one that does because it's non-refundable and it will be the seller's if the buyer decides to walk away, terminate during the due diligence period. So if a due diligence fee is given, and I would say in a seller's market like this, I would expect that due diligence fees are given, and I would suspect they're a little bit higher maybe than what they were a couple of years ago. Even though you're right, it's not a requirement to form a valid contract. So what is the approximate amount? Just, you know, I, I can't. A thousand, sometimes three, sometimes five, depending on, you know, just different prices. It properties. depends on a lot, due diligence fees are not usually a lot of money, okay. but it is negotiable. When I sold one of my investment houses for 135, I think, we only had like 250, okay. but that was three or four or five years ago. Now the market, I would imagine the seller would say, I like a little more money than that because I'm looking at another offer and I want some good assurance that I'm gonna like this one. So it depends on the price of the home. It depends on how much time the buyer's asking for the due diligence period. It depends on um, the marketplace. House is moving really fast. I can't give you a number really, I don't think. I, I, I can imagine that 500 wouldn't be out of the question on most priced homes. The higher the price, the seller's gonna expect more money. And if you think about it, if I'm taking my house off the market as an owner, as a seller, if you're asking me to take my house off the market while you decide if you want to walk away, I might even ask for something close to my house payment, depending on what the market's doing. It's negotiable. I think that's safe to say that most agents these days will tell you if they're taking their house off the market for 30 days, 45 days, they want at least their utilities and their mortgage coverage. I would think so because this is an offer to purchase. Did y'all, y'all heard Kevin, he said, most owners are gonna wanna make sure if I'm, the house goes under contract, you all know if the terms are acceptable, but this is a contract form that allows the buyer to terminate, walk away for any reason, no reason, and they don't even have to tell us as long as they do so before the end of the due diligence period. So giving the seller some money to wait while you decide if you're staying in would be appropriate. I can remember um, I, I was teaching a broker class or a continuing ed class, and we were talking about the due diligence fee, but it was in the market when it was not a seller's market. It was in the market that there was a lot to choose from, a lot of inventory, and when there's a lot of inventory, sellers have more competition, don't they? and they might agree to things that they wouldn't in a market like this. One of my students, who is a really good agent, we were talking about due diligence, and he says, I advise my buyers not to give any. And I said, shame on you. 
you know, it's part of the contract. The contract should have some integrity about it. The due diligence fee is for something. And then he said, but Jan, you forget, I'm a buyer's agent. And I said to Shay, if you're a buyer's agent, you're going to be advising your buyer to help them. If you're in a market, a buyer's market, if you will, lots of houses to choose from, a buyer can be in more control and maybe even offer less due diligence fee. It's really more market, um, um, it's more market driven, I think, than anything. Would y'all agree? Whatever the market's doing, uh, who's in the driver's seat? And right now, sellers are. And if the seller is, and they say, well, we want a little more money, but it isn't, in my opinion, going to be thousands. Of course, it, everything's relative, but I don't believe it'd be that much. And it is the fee for the time. It's for the fee for the time and the right to terminate. But the check would be written to the seller. So what does that mean in another way? Can you think of what that, what that means? If a check is written to a seller, what does that tell you? Anything? Think about that for a minute. No, about the check. I'm asking about the check. And let's compare it to earnest money deposit check. What's the difference with those checks? Earnest money is written out of the firm. And it's put in a trust account. And it's put in a trust account. Kevin said the earnest money is written out to a third party, like the, S, uh, like the listing firm maybe, or an attorney maybe, which is trending now. And it goes into escrow. That's an account where it's held in trust and is and it can't be spent, can't be used by anybody else. Oh, I am. Yeah. No, she was skipping down. <laughs> no, I wasn't either. She skipped down past the earnest money. I'm, I'm trying. Well, y'all do it. She did section one. She did section one. You just did. No, no. I'm talking about earnest money. Earnest money is uh, is more explained here. I'm trying to get y'all to think about this very first section. The initial earnest money. Y'all go on. I don't need to talk. In fact, I'm going to sit down. Y'all talk. Debbie, talk. Or whoever. You can do our section. No, I'm not. I don't want to do your section. Here's what I want. I want. Here's what I'm trying to say. I want more detail from you. I want you to tell me what you know about earnest money right, and, and, do, and due diligence fee. Okay. okay. The only thing left that you didn't mention <laughs> was like in closing, just remember it's a credit to the um, buyer. If, but I know um, the part test question is on there. Yeah. Um, also, it's not needed to make the contract valid. So are y'all hearing Caritha? She said, earnest money deposit is a credit to the buyer at closing. True. And she says it's not needed to form a, file, a valid contract. Everybody good on that? Mm -hmm. How do you know it's a credit back to the buyer at closing? What now? Because it's a debit Not the earnest money deposit. We're on another tangent now. We're on earnest money now. But this money that they pay to go through the process, so if they went they get it back. It's good faith. They gave it with the intention of entering into this uh, contract with some good faith. It credits back. And here's the clue word, deposit. When someone gives a deposit, it's intended to go back to that person. Okay? Uh, so. I, know, I want y'all to tell me a little bit more on this page. Number one, page 274, I want you to tell me about the additional earnest money and why there's time is of the essence there. And why does it say it has to be good funds, whereas the initial earnest money could be personal check. So yes, that's what I'm asking. Time of the essence, it has to be like immediately um, given, like the wire transfer. That's right. Um, but why would the additional earnest money have time us of the essence by it? Anybody uh, help out? Why would it say any additional earnest money that we're negotiating, need, we need to have it by this certain date 
time is of the essence. Why do you think that's like that? What now? It's, it's a drop dead day, so why would it be a drop dead day on the initial earnest money? It's a condition of the sale. It's a condition of the sale. Let me let me see. Y'all y'all are exactly right, but let me kind of give you a little more words on it, and then I'm going to shut up so they can do their job. All right. The additional earnest money. Let me give you an example. What if you get an offer to purchase to present to the seller? and the buyer only gives a $500 check, and let's say the house is listed at $200,000, and the buyer says, I can write a check for $200 today for earnest money. The, the buyer's agent may say to this buyer, in this market and at this price point of a house, the seller probably will expect more earnest money because say, you're showing good faith and they wanna you know, make sure you are. Do you have any other money that you can uh, contribute maybe at a later date? And the buyer might say, well, you know what? I do have tax refund coming, and I can give $1,000 more if you think that would be good enough, but I can't give it today. I can give it in two weeks. Now, think about that for a minute as from a seller's perspective. If they write in the offer $500 given to you initially with this offer, and a thousand dollars given coming in two weeks. What do you think the seller's going to put more importance on in looking at this offer? The additional money, don't you think? I'll take this offer because you said you're going to bring me more money, right? So that carries a lot of weight in the decision making, and that's why time is of the essence is there. If you don't bring it, you are in breach of contract because time is of the essence. It's a drop dead day. So does that make sense? It carries a lot of weight when the offer is presented. And if the seller is counting on that and they're taking the offer because of that, well, then it needs to be there when they say. And if the money's no good. And if the, go ahead. If the money's no good, they have one banking day? Three. One, one banking day. One banking day. If you've read over this contract, that, that's a, uh, very good. That's exactly right, and that could be a test question type thing. Everyone, if you've read over this um, contract form, it's, um, I lost my little thought there for a minute. Uh, this is a buyer terminate contract. There are one or two places where the seller can actually terminate it. This is really intended to be a buyer terminate due diligence contract, isn't it? But there are a couple of times the seller can terminate, and that's one of them. If the buyer's money is not good, like Debbie said, and the seller gives that written notice, your check bounced, you've got one banking day to give us cash or a bank check or something that's good funds, or we have a right to terminate the contract. That's exactly right. Okay, tell me what you want to tell me about the earnest money part. There's more in there than what I mentioned. Letter um, E. Um, um, at closing, um, the buyer can get back the earnest money unless they breach. Correct. Um, the earnest money must be deposited immediately in the three banking days from the contract date or three banking days from when received. Excellent. That's what I wanted you to tell me. Debbie said, earnest money deposit must be deposited immediately, no later than three banking days from contract date or from three banking days from whenever you receive it. So if we get money later, that's going to be later than the contract date, isn't it? That additional earnest money, if you get it two weeks later, well, that's way past three days from contract date. So then the clock would start ticking on that. You've got three days to get that additional money into the trust account. Excellent. 
And then I heard you say it, it's for the seller for breach. Right. Um, if they, the, buyer get, the buyer gets it back at closing as a creditor, unless, unless they breach. That's right. When we talk about the parties having a remedy, a remedy means re, um, recourse if another party breaches. What would the seller, what would that be called to the seller? Remember when we talked about compensatory damage, liquidated damage, consequential damage? What would it be? Performance. And specific performance is one, but this earnest money deposit is what the seller gets. It's the only thing they get if the buyer breaches. So I'm, I'm asking you, what would that be called? Is it compensatory damage, consequential damage, or liquidated damage? It's liquidated damage. Okay, now, uh, liquidated damage is an amount of money that both parties know they're stand to lose. So when you're negotiating at the beginning, the buyer puts in exactly how much their earnest money check is, and so they'll know exactly what they stand to lose if they breach. Compensatory damage is you gotta figure out what's due that person. Like if the seller breaches, the buyer would be entitled to how much was their appraisal if they paid it already, their credit report, the home inspection fee. It, it's not a known amount until it's added up and then uh, tallied for that amount of money. So it would be called liquidated damage. Okay, you, you're doing very good. Go ahead. saying is if one party or the other wants to sue for the return of their earnest money we would call it disputed earnest money and before they can even get to the well they could sue I reckon anytime what she's saying is the losing party will compensate the party who is prevailing over that by paying their attorney fees etc I would pay attention to the money being disputed and that's in your letter F under the escrow agent you need to know that if the earnest money amount, um, the contract even says the seller keeps it if the buyer breaches. But if the buyer says, but I dispute that, I think I should get my earnest money deposit back. If there's a dispute, the company that's holding the earnest money cannot release it unless the two uh, agree. And along the way, the uh, broker needs to give a 90-day written notice if they want to release that money out of their trust account. So they give a written notice to both parties. We would like for you to settle this dispute so we can release this earnest money out of our trust account. If you don't, we're giving you 90 days notice, we will send it to the clerk of court in the county where the property is located. The clerk of court will hold it one year and those two disputing people can try to go through that uh, navigation to get it back. And after a year, if they haven't succeeded, it will go to uh, North Carolina Treasury. It will escheat to North Carolina Treasury. And that's also a test question. Oh. So I like the note under F. Look and at the note under F. F. So remember I said, look at this as if what could be a test question? And that looks like a fine detail, doesn't it? And when we're being tested on contracts, everybody, and your agency and that sort of thing, your uh, questions are going to be detailed. So Corinth is saying, go ahead and pay attention to that. Okay, go ahead. Any interest that's earned on that trust account gets paid to the 
escrow agent. Um, that's like their payment for handling the funds. Um, and then effective date just says that it's the whoever signs the last the buyer or the seller. Um, the offer or the counter offer, that's when it becomes effective. The contract does reference in many places the effective date. So just put in your notes, the effective date is when it ripened into a contract. And if you'll remember the vision of having a, a line drawn in the sand, it has to get over to the other side before we have a contract, which would be called the effective date. <laughs> Tell us what due diligence means. Uh, and I really beg your pardon. I was just oh, trying to help. You're fine. Okay. What's um, the, tell us what due diligence means. Um, due diligence is the period that um, the um, buyer has to go through the property and investigate and see whether or not they really want to buy it. Um, it's also during this time frame that if they decide that they don't want it, that they can back out of it without penalty. Um, if they exercise the right to terminate, they get their due diligence fee back. No, not the due diligence fee. Earnest money. The earnest money. Yeah. But if they pay due diligence fee, won't they get that back if they... Not if they terminate. They, they terminate. They, uh, Debbie, <laughs> we're talking about the due diligence fee. I wouldn't call it a penalty, and she said it's not a penalty, and it isn't. It's what the, they negotiated for that amount of time. If the buyer does terminate during this time frame, they don't get that feedback because it should go to the seller for the amount of time that the buyer asked for to make the decision. But the buyer will get the earnest money deposit back because they made that in good faith and they and they decided not to stay in the contract. So for now, if all, never mind. Okay. So the due is not refundable. Good. Um, the due diligence fee at closing, it is a credit to the buyer. Is a to the seller. Guys, this, you need to know this. It's important to know. I'm sure you have a question on it. So say, why don't you say it one more time? Um, the due diligence fee at closing, it's a debit to the seller and a credit to the buyer. Is a debit to the seller and a credit to the buyer. Anybody want to say anything about that? It's a debit to the seller and a credit to the buyer. Anybody want to see if you uh, give us an explanation of why it would work that way? Debbie, do you want to or you want somebody else to help? Why is it a credit to the buyer? Help us with that. Okay. Okay. It's a um, debit to the seller because they're getting the money, and it's a credit to the buyer because they paid it out. That's right. It's a debit to the seller because they already got the money. Is what she's saying. So they shouldn't get it twice because it, it came out of the sales price and the buyer gets it as a credit at closing to buy the property because they didn't use the due diligence fee to walk away. They're going to use it to buy the property and so that's why it's a credit to them and that's why it's a debit to the buyer, uh, the, to the seller. When they got that money, you can kind of think of as it's early proceeds uh, of the sale if the buyer stays in. If the buyer leaves, it's your fee for holding the property uh, for that amount of time. Okay, good job. Okay, what else you got there? Uh, and uh, during the due diligence period, the buyer can terminate the deal by 5 p.m. on the effective date, time they have the essence, which means they have, that's the date. That's the date. Drop, drop dead date. And it needs to be in writing to the seller uh, by that date, or they're still in the contract. Everybody good on that? All right, who had the next little section? Thank you guys very much. 275, beginning with K. Thank you, thank you. Okay, Terrell. You gonna get all your team members to help you? Yes, Okay. Okay, let's go.
Letter so K at the bottom, the settlement, settlement. The settlement is when you actually finish everything right and it's the closing? Well, here's what happened. The forms committee, we only used to have the word closing. <coughs> and closing includes so many things, they kind of dissected the word. And settlement, agents do use the word interchangeably, but settlement in context here means everything's being delivered to the settlement agent. So all the paperwork is going to the attorney uh, for the closing. Everything's being delivered. The monies that need to be delivered, the paperwork and all of that. And the parties have to agree that the settlement will take place on a certain date. That's right. And that's to be in writing. That's right. Um, and then you actually close it. That's right. Good. And so tell me about that closing. What, what does that include? That would be when you actually transfer the title. Mm -hmm. All the funds are recorded, and the, the attorney has the receipt of authorization, disperse all the funds. That's when the agent will get paid, right? That's right. <coughs> the agent gets paid then, the seller gets their net proceeds then, any vendor that is due any money gets paid then. Uh, after after closing, technically, okay. Uh, it, it says if the title update should reveal unexpected liens or other title defects, or if the closing attorney is not authorized to disperse all necessary funds, then the closing shall be suspended and the settlement deemed delayed. Okay. So there is a delay in closing. And I don't know that that's in your section. It will come up in a little bit. So there is a section where there's a built-in delay in closing if something's happening that's out of the control of the buyer or seller. You know, there, there's a whole lot going on, a lot of moving uh, pieces uh, at a closing. In other words, the lender's got things that have to be done. The lawyer's got things that have to be done. Buyer and seller are doing what they can. And so there could be a delay from that target date that um, Avery mentioned. And so there's a built-in delay in closing. Good. Okay. There's, a, there's a warning given to, okay. the, um, to the buyers and the sellers, well, basically to the buyers to hire an attorney. Mm -hmm. State law. Why, an, why an attorney, Terrell? Why would... Why would we have an attorney as a buyer? Um, we're dealing with contract, legal things like that. Mm -hmm. That's their profession. And that's their profession. And in North, the Bar Association has said to do this type of work, to transfer title and prepare legal documents, it takes an attorney to do it, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, good. In the next section, Um, what is it? Prorated. No, special assessments are not prorated. What does what does prorate mean? A prorate means to divide fairly between the buyer and seller. And what Terrell just said was special assessments are not prorated. So that means somebody's going to pay the whole thing. So what did you what did you find out there? Um, types of special assessments um, uh, placed on the property, <coughs> like sidewalks and things mm -hmm. of that nature. So how would we know who would pay for it? How would we know if the seller pays for the special assessment or if the buyer pays for the special assessment? Uh, what'd you say? Confirmed. If it's a confirmed assessment, seller pays. If it's proposed, buyer pays. Okay, did you hear? Did, is that what you said too, Debbie? Yeah. No, no, they're not prorated. Uh, special assessments are not prorated. If the assessment has been confirmed, like a homeowners association assessment or like a special improvement, like you said, Terrell, if it's been confirmed, meaning it's settled, then the uh, seller will pay it out of proceeds at closing. 
If it's something that's just in the discussion uh, stage, then the buyer will buy the property and pay for it if it ever comes about. That would be called a proposed assessment. All right. Uh, Is it ever divided fairly between the two? No, not special assessments. So it confirms the, the seller, seller. seller pays, proposed is buyer. Because proposed might not even happen. You know, there's just talk about it. And so of course this would be a material fact either way that we would want the buyer to know. But if it's being talked about, not settled yet, then that means that the buyer will pay if it does come about. We're at a good break point because you're going to talk about fixtures next, aren't you? And it's a little bit great. So let's go ahead and take our break and we'll come back and get on to that.